Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. They say what's old is new again, which seems to be a perennial observation. And that's why I'm delighted to welcome a nun turned archaeologist who takes us behind the scenes of an ancient Egyptian kingdom with parallels to today's America through two of her lively historical novel series. These two intriguing series, both powerful historical fiction set in the fascinating period of Egyptian rule some 3,300 years ago. It's the Lord Honey Mysteries and the Empire at Twilight series. They rely on author N.L. Holmes' extensive knowledge of this period in ancient Egypt and her vivid imagination to dig up the past and present a relevant page-turning set of mysteries. And I'm really excited. Uh, N.L. Holmes is the pen name of a professional archaeologist who received her doctorate from Bryn Mawr College. She's excavated in Greece and in Israel and taught ancient history and humanities at the university level for many years. And she's always had a passion for books, which, of course, that's our sweet spot right here on Mysterious Goings On. And um, so I am so glad we could dig up a great author to speak with us about these fascinating novels. Welcome, N.L. Holmes, to Mysterious Goings On. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am, I got to tell you, I, uh, I, we talked to, of course, the past five years on this show, we've talked to numerous authors, uh, particularly in mystery, you know, mystery, thriller, suspense, genre fiction. And as I might've mentioned to you offline before we got started, uh, it's, it's oftentimes the historical vibe is usually a couple hundred years old at best. And here we going back 3000 years. I got to ask a uh, cart before the horse or horse before the cart uh, being a, a archeologist by trade. Was this just something that came naturally to you or was it a different, different way? Well, it's certainly my, my professional training uh, fed into it. In fact, I think what gave me the idea to start writing a series of historical novels was a project I gave to my students in a class on ancient Near Eastern empires. Um, I assigned them to take these very few uh, documents that we had referencing a particular event and try to reconstruct what happened. And that, of course, that's what historians do too. But it was pretty clear from the results, that, which were terrifically diverse, that it required as much imagination as, you know, historiography. So I figured this was a space for a, a novelist to step in. It sounds like, you know, you know, the first thing that occurred to me is uh, as a writer myself, but I, I am, I think I've gone back maybe 10 years. No, actually, that's not true. I did co-write a Western that's about 100 years ago. That's true. But um, even then, though, there are a lot of the things that I like to call also as a former actor, a little bit of business. You know what I'm saying? When you there are things that you do to add that verisimilitude to the piece, correct? And uh, for me, it's uh, maybe the character will have a cigarette or he'll go get a cup of coffee or he'll look at his phone or something like that. You know, I'm just kind of curious. And I know this is like a, a granular thing to ask in the grand scope before we really talk about what the books are about. But I'm just curious if... Uh, if you had any way stations that you had to conceive of with your imagination about how characters in their day-to-day -day business occupy themselves in ancient Egypt. Well, that, that was certainly an issue. And of course I did all the research I could do, but then there's still the element of imagination beyond that. You, my whole goal is to convince people that these uh, strangely dressed and, and foreign language speaking people of the past were just like us. I mean, they had the same same emotions exactly. So I guess it it's probably not too far off to picture what it might have been like. And I'm uh, very concerned, as you point out, to create a, a visual picture of the world and all the other sensory information I can provide. So I hope the reader will kind of come along with me on that journey into the past as a real place. Yeah, that, I think that uh, to a good many people, and I, okay, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, readers, uh, you know, cast your stones later, um, that a lot of people's concept uh, of ancient Egypt is, is right out of Cecil B. DeMille to a degree. Yeah, I, that's probably true. I, I'm naming no names, but I have read novels that were 
about at that level of authenticity. And <laughs> <laughs> so I've tried to, to go the one better and really ground everything in, in fact, as far as it's known. But the truth is of this period so far in the past, we, we don't know everything. And so it's, you know, even a lot of what seems like really, um, really authentic detail may be made up because uh, plausibly, I hope, but I'm having to fill in the gaps of our actual knowledge. You know, it's, I know it's, it's apples to oranges to a degree. And I, I but I wanted to ask you this, uh, or just mention this, that I've been reading a lot about, of course, uh, uh, more excavations at Vesuvius, not the same place, I understand, but we are seeing so many things, though, that are just what you just said, Nikki, which is that, I mean, I think I saw something where there was like a, uh, uh, it's a stall or a vendor who had like a dog, dog treats or something, and he had some doggerel <laughs> on the wall that we, was excavated. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think those excavations that get into everyday life are much more interesting and important than the palaces or what have you, although those have their place. Uh, that's when you really start getting a sense of, of these were human beings living human life as we know it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the series, please. And you just take this uh, take this ball and run with it. Um, t tell us what we uh, tell us a little bit about the series and what we need to know about these series and, and why you think this would be a great place for for mystery lovers in particular to get started reading. Well, the Lord Hani mysteries um, is set in the 14th century in ancient Egypt during the reign of Akhenaten, the so-called heretic pharaoh. So it was a time of extreme social, religious upheaval. Uh, people were, when he com completely put down the, uh, uh, the, the old religion, it uh, left people totally at sea and their whole value system had been cut out from under their feet. So I think you must certainly have had the same kind of uh, backlash as we've had in modern times with society, technology seems to be moving too fast. And on top of that, there was a plague going on. So there's another level of parallelism. But the books themselves, uh, although they're set in these situations, are mostly um, a whodunit, which is self-contained within each volume. And then there's political intrigue, which continues from volume to volume. And also a lot of family drama, which also has an arc uh, throughout the whole series. So Ahani is a, a family man with a number of children and the little ones grow up in the course of the novels and what have you and become uh, more active in the stories. Oh, that's fascinating. So, and so it's an arc, it's a true series. And, but what I love about this is uh, some of my favorite series are where the characters are allowed to age and they are allowed to change. Um, they're not simply the same. And, and that's no knock on on series where it's basically the same every time, you know, but I really enjoy this because you, you're, you're truly along for the journey of their lives for the ride. You know, you touched on this about um, uh, parallels to where we are now. And, you know, uh, I think at first blush, you, you'd hear about parallels and you think, oh, that's kind of eerie, but it's really, as I did with the lead and it's not, is it? It's like you've been kind of saying here is Alex we're the same people we were 3,000 years ago we're just in we just have iPhones I, I assume that's a lot of it is that fair to say is, is that yeah I think technology technology is perhaps the, the part of um, their lives that is most unrecognizable to us uh, believe it or not the people who built the pyramids had had very simple technology and uh, their their worldview was different than ours they believed everything was the active work of the gods and things were kind of, nature was sort of animate and divine. And uh, so it gave them a different sense of cause and effect than ours perhaps. But under it all, they had the same qu uh, quiver of emotional responses that we do. And so even if they saw an event as, as coming from the gods, they could only respond to it in a certain number of ways, just like us. So I think, looking at history as a as a process over time you sometimes get the feeling that nothing ever changes and to some extent that's true because we're the same animal from beginning to end yeah. uh, you hope there's a little progress that we're spiraling gradually upward in some ways but sometimes you've got to ask yourself <laughs> well, strange days indeed, uh, as John Lennon said, most peculiar mama. Um, now I'm with you on that I 
I, I'm interested, though, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier, too, about the Cecil B. DeMille conception of Egypt. And uh, I will tell you, though, that I, as a young, young, young man, when the King Tut phenomenon was in full bloom, then the touring King Tut exhibit went nationwide. I went to that and was just astounded uh, by that. Um, but that that itself is just is more of an outlier, is it not? That whole I mean, King Tut was not important to any degree, was he? Or am I mistaken there? No, he was a, a very minor king. He was not eight or nine when he came to the throne, and eighteen or nineteen when he died. Uh, so they probably had to scramble to fill his tomb. But that being said, he was a king. He was considered a divine king, and the contents of his tomb, I, I have heard would have been about the equivalent of a 10,000 years of salary for an ordinary working class person. So you can see how, how much effort and expense went into the burial, even of a, of a minor dead king. Uh, the, the king of Egypt was on a kind of a different plane altogether than his subjects. Everything in the country was thought to belong to him personally, all the resources. So um, you couldn't spend enough on your dead king. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a it's a far cry from uh, where where King Farouk ended up in what 1960 whatever that was. He was deposed, as I recall, and living out right. his days in Italy as a kind of a uh, <laughs> louche bon vivant. <laughs> it is not the same. <laughs> Um, but, you know, what about, though, King Tut's father, that kingdom that came ahead of Tut? Uh, did, that, did that set things in motion, uh, or was that, was that more normal? And then we had Tut, this boy king who didn't last very long. Did that become a situation where everything became a scramble for power, or were there, were there chancellors in place to, to, to handle this stuff? Uh, things seemed to move pretty smoothly. The, the, there was a gap between the death of Akhenaten who really was the great disruptor. He was the one who had overturned everything. When he died, it, it's we're not even sure of what happened, but the names of several different kings keep cropping up. And one of them we think was Queen Nefertiti uh, as, a, as a ruler. And then Tut comes along and he is succeeded by his grandfather since he had no children, uh, no living children. And after him, a, a general uh, from the army who was married into the grandfather's family. But that was the beginning of a peculiar phenomenon in the past, and that was a damnation of the memory. They completely cut Akhenaten and the, his immediate successors out of their history. It was as if they never existed. And it was only when we started finding artifacts that testified to the existence of, of Akhenaten that we even knew he, he had ever been. So there was a backlash, all right, and Tut himself was kind of caught between the two. He was he was neither the overturning of his father's um, his father's overturning of uh, societal values, nor of the the suppression of all evidence that he had ever existed. So it was it was an interim reign. So uh, what do we what do we what can we glean? What, in your opinion, Nikki? What can we glean though today? If we're if we're harking back there, what I mean, I, we've already I know we've already covered that humanity people are the same, but uh, we we live in the longest surviving democracy, at least uh, as of I check my watch, we're still there. And uh, um, <laughs> what what can we glean there? And I guess and, I, and sorry to to compound the question, but is that is that in your work? Is you you know what I'm saying? Are you reaching back but but looking forward at the same time? Well, I, I, I think it's inevitable, frankly. Um, one thing that we can learn from reading about this period is that you can't force change too rapidly. People just can't take it, and they will, they will react mindlessly. It's, it's just like a kind of physical pain they snap back against. I think that was part of the problem with uh, Akhenaten, although it, what the people wanted was no issue with him. He was a total autocrat. But what the and you know the ruling class wanted this was very important. He he alienated the priesthoods, he alienated the bureaucracy, uh, and those were the people, you know, with the power to support or or put him down. Also, I guess you could learn 
that it's always true that people have conscience issues. What does is a what does a servant of a bad regime do? Does he disobey, refuse to obey bad orders, and see his family wiped out, perhaps, or are deposed? So I think conscience issues are something that are uh, uniform or universal, at least, throughout history. And and the fact that Hani is a good man, a principled man, trying to do his job uh, without succumbing to the, you know, the smoke and mirrors around him is is probably something that anyone could identify with. Yeah. No, I mean, there, there have been, uh, sorry to use this term, there have been a deep state as long as there's been a state. Is that fair? Pretty much. Pretty much. There's a there's always a bureaucratic class that keeps things running um, that is probably probably has saved civilization as much as uh, as hindered it. Uh, I don't know. Um, but that's interesting what you're saying, though, about people. There, there's so many of these key events, I think, like the burning of the library at Alexandria, the, when, when people just, like you said, they just snap. It's too fast. And they're, they're ginned up for whatever reason. And things get out of control. Uh, I, I heard something interesting uh, just recently on, on a program about how um, politicians might be better served to follow the people to a larger degree than they do. Um, that, to me, that sounds antithetical. I mean, I'm like, well, I know we elect people to be leaders. We don't elect them to just do what the mob says. But to your point, if you go too fast and, and things move too quickly for people, they can't, I think you said they can't handle it or a large degree. Right. And then, then they, then we have the forks and pitchforks with the pitchforks and torches out there. Right. Exactly. And I think technology is another thing that can move too fast. Uh, I think a lot of these people who are disgruntled today have just found themselves rolling in the dust with the robotization of, of kind of manual labor and everything's online. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand it, don't have computers. So I think only of that plays into a kind of um, generic alienation that that isn't a good thing. Well, to your point too, social media, I think, has outstripped uh, our emotional ability to handle it at this point. Uh, right. You know, uh, that's kind of a part of my day job and, and what I deal with in communications and things. It's just, and I've seen this and, and you know, the, the digital mob is out there, the cancel culture, the, and I, I'm not making a political statement, I'm just saying there, there are, it's a very easy way to get yourself into trouble is to be vocal on social media, You, Right. Um, I, I had a colleague say, yeah, one glass of wine too many on a Friday night and you could wreck your whole life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm fascinated by that. And that's why I'm, I'm very interested too to, to see this because uh, I, I believe Hani represents so much though this, uh, what you said, he is, he is a decent person. He has his place and he has his role in this society. Um, but he's put in this task of would you call him, I mean, would you call him an investigator? Or what would you call him? What is his role? Well, he is a real person, although we don't know anything about him as a, as a you know, a personality. Uh, he was a diplomat, an emissary, um, what you might say an ambassador. He was sent out repeatedly to um, various parts of the Near East, uh, given very, you know, trusting tasks by the, the king. And so I've tried to recreate a person who would be that kind of person and someone who would be trusted through a, a variety of, of regimes. And uh, so it's not a professional investigator, but he's kind of the go to guy if if an ambassador gets bumped off or something, don't let us go to war, find out who did this. And then in his own life, he, he finds himself called into uh, problematic cases to investigate for his family or for other people, even um, even the, the royal family while he's back in Egypt. So I guess you could say an investigator, he, he investigates. Yeah, I love that though, I, I prefer that. I, I prefer that too, that's in my series. My guy's not an investigator, he does other things, but he keeps being pulled into situations and he seems to be the one who can help figure things out. I think, I think, re I think readers enjoy that and they identify with that a little bit more. It's just me though. Um, if we could jump to, uh, we can jump from Lord Hani to um, your other series, though. Tell us a little bit about Empire at Twilight. The Empire at Twilight series is is more diverse than the Lord Hani mysteries, um, and they're much looser uh, related. They're 
pretty much self-contained each one. It's uh, they're all set in the time the same time, which is the 13th century in the Hittite Empire, which is in uh, modern Turkey, and some of its uh, its Mediterranean vassal states. And there's really no no connection between the stories. Uh, in a, in one exception. Uh, two different books deal with the same event from the perspective of different people. Hmm. But uh, for the most part, characters from one book only occur as a kind of cameo in another. And they're, uh, they're more just dramas. I think the first volume of uh, The Lightning Horse has an element of mystery, but it's really a, a coming of age story. And The Queen's Dog, there's some political, uh, well, I guess all the, all the others today have some political intrigue going on but it's not about that it's about uh the sort of the the personal struggles of an individual so drama i guess you'd say Hmm. and have uh have you found that the the readership for the different series are they the same folks do you think or do you have that kind of demographic information yet in some cases i know they are people who like one series will you know go on and read the next one uh but but other than the names I'm aware of that keep showing up in the Amazon reviews and things like that, I, I don't know. Uh, I think more people can identify with Egypt because it's better known. I doubt if many people even know who the Hittites were. And of course, that's kind of where I swing into action is to let them know. Right. But, but um, it, it will be hard to say until more books have sold, more time has gone by to see if there's how much overlap there is. Let me uh, take a step back here and just ask you a few things, uh, uh, because it's, it's rare I get to speak with, with a trained archeologist uh, as well, uh, so someone so versed in history. Do, do, you think, um, do you think the average person is any more or any less informed about, you did mention the Hittites in, in history. Are we any more or less informed these days in your opinion? Well, I, I think probably all the coverage that um, the social media and YouTube and things like that give to new discoveries, uh, there are reliable sources on the social media like National Geographic or Archaeology Magazine that uh, do try to bring, at least on a superficial level, a, a basic sense of what's going on in the world of archaeology. And I think that's terrific. I, I have no... Uh, No criticisms for popularization. I think that's our duty. We can't just keep talking to ourselves, you know, a few scholars who even know who the Hittites are. Uh, I've got to make them known. And that that's also where historical fiction fits in, I think. Well, I agree. And uh, that's uh, one of my great heroes uh, uh, is Carl Sagan, because he was an effective communicator about science. Now, he exactly you, you can probably find many scientists who thought he was you know, not a great, I don't know, I'm not just making that up, they had their issues with him, but uh, he, he lit a fire in me watching Cosmos, the original, of course, as a young, young person uh, about learning. I mean, it's pretty, pretty weird to see, I'm sure my parents were, why did a 12 year old ask for broke his brain for Christmas and read it? Now, I don't pretend I understood it all, but I read it. So I'm always, um, I'm always gratified to see particularly in this, to, 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 to paraphrase Sagan, this demon haunted world we live in, to see that there are people like yourself who are finding ways through thrilling fiction to, to spark an interest. Um, I'm the type of reader too. Uh, I will start plowing into your books and then I'll be like, I don't know anything about Hakanon, but I'm going to go find out and I'm not going to stop at Wiki, like, Wikipedia. I'm going to go to some real sources. Um, so I, I, I just think that's fascinating. Can I ask you though, is there a misconception as an archaeologist? I know it's the Indiana Jones question, but is there a common misconception you get about uh, being an archaeologist? Do people come to you all the time with kind of the same question or, or thought? Well, the first uh, misconception that I get a lot of is, oh, you dig up dinosaur bones. <laughs> I, no, I don't mean to laugh because that's that's just a misconception. Right. Uh, archaeologists deal with human remains, uh, artifacts of, of human manufacture. And probably the second question I get a lot is, uh, what's it like to go after treasure? Or, you know, what's the f- most fabulous thing you've ever found? And 
I don't think many archaeologists look at upon it as a treasure hunt in any way, shape, or form. We're we're looking to uh, recreate life, human life, in the past. So all the uh, all the gold in the world, it's just trouble for the excavator. They've the the government of where they're digging will shut it down, and that you have to have guards. I mean, it's it's a terrible burden. What we'd rather find are I, items of people's intimate lives that shed light on something we didn't know before. And I've got to say that the, the most impressive or, or moving artifact that I've ever been present when it was excavated was a large vase, maybe two, three feet tall, that had broken into about 250 pieces. And when we put it back together, we found that the entire surface was covered with handprints. Uh, and it was, there was something, you know, this was a, a unique handprint. It could only have belonged to one person in the history of the universe. And I found that so, so moving. And it was like they were reaching up from the past saying, remember me, worth more than all the gold it touched <laughs> to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that kind of does get, in a way, the the popular, the Indiana Jones thing, too, where the, one of the competing archaeologists says, look at this, uh, this, uh, this cheap, uh, you know, timepiece. Uh, it's worth 75 cents now or whatever. You bury it for a thousand years and dig it up and it's priceless. Because true. Of- I'm, I'm afraid that's true. <laughs> 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 but it's priceless in a different way than money, really. Really, um, I was just seeing something in the news this morning about a step plate or something in England that was found. It was an old Roman part of an old Roman uh, a step. You step on it to get on your horse. I think I forget what it's called, but found that and somebody had been using it uh, uh, as a step plate, or maybe it was just a piece of pot, uh, not pottery, but a piece of something that was uh, there. And it's just so it's just so interesting that uh, those things keep popping up and. Um, you're talking about how you're on a, on a on a dig or something, and sometimes you, in popular culture, archaeologists get made to be the bad guys in a way because it's like, okay, everybody, stop, stop progress, so we can use our little little paintbrushes to start looking for things and stuff like that. Is that 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 doesn't happen as much as I would assume as we we see on popular TV and stuff like that. I I don't know. I I think it happens or should happen quite a lot, uh, particularly in old places like Europe or or the Near East. Every time you sink a foundation for a building, you're likely to hit medieval things or earlier, you know, and and once they've been destroyed, they're gone. Yeah. And part of our history has been lost. Um, so that's that is a problem for archaeologists in cities that have been continuously inhabited for thousands of years. Places like Beirut or Damascus, they, older levels were scraped off by the Romans who wanted to reconstruct, you know, their own buildings and and now we come along and want to scrape off the Romans. It's, um, it, it hurts, I have to say, although you can't stop life in progress. Well, the, on, the, on the island of Crete, we used to have trouble a lot with the, the local farmers who would actually destroy Minoan tombs and things like this because they knew that if the archaeologists came, they would be pushed off the land. It would become public land. And they didn't want to lose their olive groves or something. So you know, there's a balance in there somewhere, but I'm not sure where it lies. Oh, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Um, there's, I, yeah, I guess here, uh, part of the world I'm from, uh, the, you know, uh, Oak, grew up in Oklahoma and this area, I'm in Missouri now, but I think the things we, we would typically find more than anything else would be, you could find, you'd be lucky if you found an arrowhead. Yeah. which would be a, a lovely thing to find. We used to, I used to actively go, you know, I've already let you in on what kind of a child I was. So I used to go <laughs> dicking in the back. A fellow, <laughs> a fellow nerd. And I was like, I just know, you know, I asked my father if I could help him dig his tomato garden. And he was like, oh, you want to help? I was like, yeah, I, I like tomatoes just fine. But I was just really hoping I'd hit something, something good. <laughs> yeah, I used to do that too. Did you really? Did you really? Oh, well, yes. You, oh, yes. And you, you've had it just to briefly touch on you've had such an interesting life. So you you were you were a nun for 20, right. 25 years, pretty close that? to 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And then you 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 heard a different calling. Is that a, I don't mean that in a punny way at all. But I, I say that was fair enough. I felt that it had served its purpose and I had served my purpose there and had something else I was supposed to do. And I think in retrospect, it was teaching. And, and are you, what are you doing? Are you a full-time author now? Or are you still teaching? 
Uh, I am not teaching any longer. I, I'm writing full time. That's right. Yeah, right. Right. Well, it's a full time job for sure. Um, well, tell me, uh, Nikki, as, our, as we got to wrap up here, but tell me what's uh, what's something that uh, that that uh, people should know about uh, these series. Should they? Which one should they start with, or does it matter? Just start with one, or of course we. As the writer myself, I'd say buy them all. But where <laughs> right, would you, that's that's where my you, <laughs> my line. <laughs> where would you start? Well, I, I perhaps the um, the Lord Honey mysteries because they appeal to people who like cozy mysteries. Yeah. But I have to say, and this is not flattering to myself, the first one of that series is pretty dense. Uh, it covers a couple of years, and people do a lot of traveling, and there are a lot of names that were foreign, even to the Egyptians. So it's perhaps a little harder to get through. Uh, but from then on, it simplifies and, you know, there's uh, more unity of time and place. As far as the other series go, I think those books are more approachable. Although um, after The Lightning Horse, they, they're pretty intense emotionally and, and there's some violence. So if people don't like that, then that isn't where they should start. But uh, so far, the response has been good. So I think, you know, there's something someone might enjoy too. Yeah, and, and listeners, they're very well review, uh, reviewed on Amazon, and that's that's a huge deal. Uh, as I've whinged about for years on this very show, how hard it is to get people to even write a starred review on Amazon, but then to get a starred review that is so um, uh, celebratory of the work. Uh, kudos to you, Nikki. Congrats on this. That's wonderful. Um, so I will tell you, is, is Amazon the best place to go for the Lord Hani Mysteries and, of course, the Empire at Twilight series? Uh, Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Apple, um, Google Play, they're out there everywhere. And even some, some brick-and-mortar bookstores somewhere. <laughs> what are those? I, I don't know. Someone has been buying buying them in quantity so i assume it's a bookstore well i was going to say we might require your services as an archaeologist to find a, a good one. <laughs> oh, true. I, i'm sorry to say that and you've got uh, i think i think uh, the the crocodile makes no sound is also available as an audible audiobook correct that's correct yes that's i, I started with the second one because it was less difficult for the, the voiceover actor <laughs> <laughs> well we'll back up and do the first one next Oh, that sounds so great. Well, uh, author N.L. Holmes, uh, I am fascinated by you and your work. And 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 I, I don't say this to every guest, but I'll say it to you. Thanks a lot. Now I've got to clear even more room off my bedside table for a big stack of books. It's wonderful. Um, but the idea of a cozy mystery taking place way back 3,000 years sounds just, just delightful to me today. So thanks so much for joining us here on Mysterious Goings On. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading.